Uh, so Henry, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your new book? Uh, yeah, of course. Thanks very much for inviting me, Claire. Um, my book is called A Very Short History of Life on Earth, and it really is short. I've got it. You can hold it in the palm of your hands. And the subtitle is 4.6 billion years in 12 pithy chapters. I find it hard to say pithy because I'm losing my teeth. Um, but actually, it's I give you a, another billion years at the end uh, for free. So you get that at no extra charge. Uh, so that's the book. Now, I um, was a, uh, I am a, um, a recovering paleontologist. Uh, I was always a dinosaur geek uh, and always a fossils geek. And um, there's somebody uh, who's uh, listening to us, that's uh, Per Alberg. And if it's the Per Alberg that I think it is, he's one of my very oldest friends and my best man. Um, we were graduate students together. He'll be joining us from Uppsala in Sweden. So Per will correct me if my memory is wrong on, on any of these things. There he is. Hello, Per. Uh, and um, I did my first degree at the University of Leeds in zoology and genetics. Uh, and then uh, thinking I would grow up and not be a paleontologist anymore. But no. So I went to uh, Cambridge and uh, looked at uh, fossil cows from the Ice Age. I had wanted to look at fossil fish, but basically, as a paleontologist, I realised that cows are just very specialised fish that swim in water of negative depth. And once I got used to that, I was it was plain sailing. Uh, but I found I didn't enjoy research very much. I was always writing things. I was writing for my college magazine. I was writing for the university magazines. I was writing, writing, writing. And I was really more interested in what everyone else was doing. So, of course, uh, as soon as I, uh, as I was finishing my PhD, uh, by a very strange uh, and thoroughly unbelievable uh, chain of events, I ended up as a journalist on the science journal Nature. Nature is one of the most ancient and venereal, sorry, venerable science journals in the world. It's been going since 1869. And uh, on Friday, I was a PhD student. On Monday, I was a, a journalist uh, and I learned everything I know about writing and writing very quickly about something I know nothing about with apparent authority. Uh, I turned up at my job at 9.30 on a Monday morning at the office in London and was given to the junior news reporter. Uh, and I said, well, what would you like me to do? And he said, I'd like you to write a news story about radiological protection guidelines, of which I knew nothing. And I said, great, I said. Uh, I said, when would you like it? He said, no pressure, lunchtime. Uh, so um, he gave me the a, a, a phone number of a, of a friendly person and um, at the Radiological Protection Authority. And I wrote that story. And after that, I uh, became a, a journalist. And also, after writing a lot about everything you can possibly imagine at impossible deadlines, I wanted to join the what's called the back half of nature. These are the group of hardened ex lab rats who actually select the scientific papers that scientists all over the world send to Nature for publication. Uh, Nature publishes the coolest, most amazing, most groundbreaking research in the world, although I have to say that other science journals are available, uh, but um, that's what we do. And uh, since, uh, since, the early, since the end of the 1980s, I've been doing that. So I've been doing that for uh, 33 and a third revolutions, which I think must be a long playing record. Uh, so I've been doing that for a while. And as a paleontologist by uh, training, they gave me all the fossils to look at, as well as quite a lot of other things. I tend to do fossils, evolutionary biology and aliens from outer space. Uh, so uh, I've had the great privilege of nursing to publication a lot of the fossils that have made the headlines over the past three decades from uh, feathered dinosaurs to the very strange hobbit creature from Indonesia that came out in 2004 uh, and uh, peculiar fish with legs that crawled onto land uh, uh, three four hundred million years ago or so. Uh, that's Professor Albert's speciality. Oh, he's still here. He hasn't gone off and discussed yet. And um, 
so that's what I decided, uh, that that's what I've been doing all this time. Now, I, I should say, uh, to echo what Claire said, is if you'd like to ask a question, please don't be shy. Do it any time. Type it into the chat and I'll get into it, Get look at the chat when I need to take a breath or if I ever come to the end of the sentence, which might be about twice in the next hour. Because I do tend to ramble, so you'll probably need just to stop me occasionally. Uh, the first question that people haven't asked me is how did I get to write this book well I've, I've have had this idle thought of writing a book on the history of life on earth and I'd call it something like Henry's history of life on earth something very simple and like all uh, ideas it just got filed to the back of my brain because I usually got distracted so it joined the lumber room in the back of my brain with the rusty bikes and the half-eaten pork pies and the old boots and the brass bedsteads and um, the barbecue that you never use because it's always raining and, and, and all that um, and there it generally stayed and um, I'd go into the lumber room and, and have a look at it and then forget about it but then when I was at Nature, uh, when I wasn't looking at the papers, I'd go uh, and uh, interrupt the news journalists uh, and one uh, uh, and um, see what they were doing. And one of my colleagues was a chap called David Adam, who's, uh, who's not at Nature anymore. He's uh, flown off to pastures new. Uh, he used to write our leaders. And he'd written a couple of books, uh, psychology. One's called um, The Man Who Couldn't Stop. And it's about his own battles with OCD. It's a very good book. And another one is called the genius within about mind hacks about if it's true you can buy tablets or or little kits to make you more intelligent to pass exams and he tried various things so we chat about our work in works in progress and i'd just finished a book uh, here it is it's called across the bridge views on the origin of vertebrates now published by the university of chicago press uh, and that was a rather technical book I call it my contractual obligation book, uh, which I've try, been trying very hard not to write for 20 years, but I found myself backed into a corner at a conference by with three scientists who were, wanted me to write this book and my editor, who was just nodding her head. So I wrote that book. So I was talking to David Adam and he asked me what I was going to write. And I said, I'm after Across the Bridge, I'm not going to write another expletive book ever again. Uh, he ignored me and said, Henry, he said, that's my name. Henry, why don't you write a book about all the fossils you've had the chance to uh, steer to publication over the years? And I thought that was uh, 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 quite a great idea. Uh, and um, still protesting I wasn't going to write the expletive book, I wrote the expletive book. And Susan has written, have you found or read anything scientific that surprised you and what was it? Well, on one level, life is full of surprises. And certainly in uh, paleontology, uh, you can always be surprised by the next thing that somebody digs up that overturns the scientific consensus. Uh, but the most surprising thing that ever came to my desk ever was in uh, in March 2004. It might have been 2003. Anyway, it was about that time. It was the discovery of a strange skeleton of a tiny little person in a cave on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And uh, this little person was only three foot tall and had great big feet. So it was soon known as the Hobbit. And it was very 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 strange looked very primitive in many ways which was um unusual as it was believed to be only eighteen thousand years old which is like yesterday that the age has been revised down to fifty thousand, which is just like the day before yesterday at that time there were already modern humans all over the planet so what this little relic little imp creature was doing there uh, and, uh, and why and how it survived nobody knew uh, uh, usually when people send papers to nature you can tell they're pretty stoked about it and have some good idea about its significance and sometimes oversell it but it was quite clear that these authors had no idea what they'd found they were as mystified as anyone else because it was unexpected because 
they didn't know what they were looking for. Uh, or for, well, they did know what they were looking for, and it wasn't that. There's a big uh, controversy in archaeology, and the controversy is how people, how and when people first got to that magic continent far away, nowadays associated with cold lager and uh, uh, the adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Um, and some people say it was 60,000, some people say it was 90,000, some people say it was 40,000, a great deal of disagreement. So one way of possibly answering this is to trace the movement of people from Ireland, Southeast Asia, island topping along the little uh, the chain of islands from Java to Lombok to Bali to Flores, off to Timor and then, uh, then to Australia, which during the Ice Age, it would have been easier because the sea levels were much lower, so people could have hopped, even walked from one place to the other. Well, uh, they were looking in a cave that had been pretty well explored. It wasn't a remote cave. Uh, it was, um, it's, a, it's, it's a, like a great big cathedral. It's a huge cave, but it's uh, very easy to get into. Uh, and it's a nice cool place and the villagers have been using it for decades as a schoolroom, as a meeting place. There's even a farmer's tarot patch in the cave mouth, um, but it's just full of dirt, dirt going down to bedrock. And it had been excavated for years by a fellow called Father Paul Verhoeven. You see, I'm just going on for ages and ages about it until people stop me. And, um, uh, uh, and they were looking for human beings and they found this weird creature and it was so unexpected it was really an unknown unknown and it overturned uh, anthropology instantly because it um, showed to people that there was a great diversity of human creatures that lived on the earth until fairly recent times because uh, if you think about it what is the probability that a group of people digging in a cave in Indonesia happened to find the only strange, weird, undiscovered hominin that ever existed. Answer, nil. And some other weird, strange hominins of sil hominin, that means member of the human family, have been found since in the Philippines. And uh, fossil yetis have been found in, in the Tibetan plateau. I call them yetis, but they're not really. Uh, although they did contribute the gene to the human race that allows um, uh, Tibetans to live at high altitude. Oh, the questions are coming in. Uh, uh, why did I want to study prehistoric fish and how are they like prehistoric cows? A good question. I was always interested in roots and beginnings and I was interested in the origins of the vertebrates, the backboned animals, ever since I was uh, small. And uh, from the age of five, I used to be haunting the Natural History Museum uh, in London. Uh, Back then, not many other people were. It was rather a dusty, fusty place. Uh, and there was a, one of the least visited galleries, which meant I had it all to myself, was the Hall of Fossil Fish. And it used to have fossil fish in, 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 in their fossils displayed in chronological order, going from one end to the other. And I used to stay at the, the deep end uh, where it was the origins of the fishes. And they used to have these dioramas like aquariums with models of the fossil fish and I was looking at the origins of these things and my friend Professor Alberg who's still here did say to me at his when he gave the best man speech at my wedding I was the other nerdy kid. Now uh, Per actually has continued to study fossil fish. Uh, I was going to study fossil fish um, but it was a question of timing and getting the grant money and I just happened to get a, a, a place to study fossil cows, but there were fossils. Also, there are lots and lots of them, and it meant I could do some statistics on whole populations, which I could use my genetic genetics training to good effect. Um, well, why are they? Why why are they? Why are fishes like cows? Well, all vertebrates are basically fish. All backboned animals are fish. In fact, most backboned animals still are fish, uh, but. Uh, uh, between three and four hundred million years ago, a lineage of fish that tended to live in ten it tended to live in shallow water and had rather stumpy leg-like fins, sometimes found themselves living in water of negative depth. And they didn't boldly go onto land. What they would do is try and scurry back underwater as quickly as possible. Uh, but these were the fish that were closest to land to start to make life on land a possibility. And uh, we are basically uh, highly adapted fish 
for living in water of negative depth, and so are cows. Uh, if you look at traditional uh, taxonomic treatments of animals in which the animals are listed, you always find the mammals are at the end, and at the end are the even-toed ungulates, and at the end of those are the cows. So of course cows are the most sophisticated and highly evolved creatures of all, but one problem that cows don't have is they can't read, so I've actually written the book for us rather than cows. In fact, the only cows that can read are probably in Gary Larson cartoons. Uh, Laurie says, does my book start with microorganisms or? It starts before the origin of life. It starts with a supernova that happened in space well before the Earth and the solar system was formed. Uh, what happens in a supernova is a star runs out of things to burn. It starts by burning hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe, and it, it, it fuses hydrogen nuclei to make helium, uh, and there is a huge amount of energy release. That's for the fusion furnace, and that makes the star shine. And the energy does more than make the star shine. It keeps the star inflated against gravity, which is huge in a star. If the star stopped burning, the gravity would squeeze it to a tiny mass very, very quickly, and there'd be an explosion. There'd be a, the rebound would cause a, a huge explosion. So the star was beginning to run out of hydrogen. It started to burn helium and fuse that into carbon and other things. Um, but of course, as it started to fuse heavier and heavier, heavier elements, it become, became more and more difficult to do so and released less and less energy. Uh, and eventually it had got desperate. It was chucking on the furniture and the cat and um, the chairs uh, and then eventually and the window frames and it had uh, it had run out. So when it had run out, the moment it ran out, the star collapsed, woof, and the rebound created a supernova. And during that super, that supernova spread all these chemical elements, carbon and oxygen and so on, throughout space. And in the supernova, very heavy elements were created um, beyond iron. It's quite easy to fuse things to iron, but you need a supernova to create anything like uranium or lead or all the heavy elements. And the gravitational shock wave carried these elements throughout the, uh, throughout the galaxy until um, billions of years later, they met um, a cloud of gas and dust and hitting it, it caused the cloud of gas and dust to implode. The, the waves pushed the matter together so they stuck together and started to implode and whirl around like bath water going around a, a tap. They whirled around and at the centre where the mass was greatest, the mass became sufficiently tightly packed to create a new, a new fusion engine, the sun. And, that, and all the all the little uh, whirls of looking like a cinnamon swirl or a Danish pastry. Imagine Danish pastry. Imagine, here's a metaphor, imagine all the raisins in a Danish pastry, the planets and all the, all the icing is kind of the swirly clouds of stuff. Well, eventually it all coalesces until they're just large raisins covered in icing going around. And a lot of them are bashing into each other for a while. And that's how uh, the earth started. Um, the Earth was for a while just a ball of magma uh, with a lot of other things hitting it. As soon as the crust would try and form, something would hit it and blast the crust into space. Uh, a very large object, the size of Mars, hit the Earth, a glancing blow, and disintegrated. And uh, for a while, the Earth had rings around it. Uh, until that those rings glommed together and became the moon. And this is why the Earth and the moon are so special, because most planets with moons, the moons are usually stray asteroids or have come from somewhere else. But the Earth and moon are very similar in composition. But the moon's much smaller and it's too small to hold an atmosphere. Um, so that's why it's, it's, uh, it's quite airless. Uh, uh, as opposed to hairless, which is me. Uh, I'll try not. I could wear a fez, and that would stop you being blinded by my dome. Anyway, uh, the Earth's atmosphere was not very breathable. It was full of uh, methane and carbon dioxide and ammonia and uh, unpleasant things, but it also had a lot of water vapor. And um, as the Earth cooled 
and the crust settled out. If you can imagine, the, all the heavy elements went to the center to become a liquid iron rotating molten metal core. And all the light elements like aluminium and silicon and oxygen formed a kind of souffle on the surface and that's the crust. And then there was the atmosphere and it got cool enough for all that water vapor to condense and fall as rain. Now it rained and rained for millions of years, which even it was probably even more, more than it rains in Spokane, I would imagine. The rain in Spokane stays mainly in the plain, but it rained for millions of years until the world was completely covered in water without Kevin Costner in it. There, that's a reference for people who watch films in the 90s. God, that was a dreadful film. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, and it was in the ocean that life began. Life began in the deeps of the sea uh, where um, the crust, the, the, the bits of the crust are slamming together and where in between cracks in the crust, um, boiling water jets up into the, into the sea, carrying minerals. And even though it's boiling water and you know, well over 100 degrees, it stays liquid because of the pressure. And a lot of the volcanic rocks are like pumice, they're full of little holes. And a lot of the, the chemistry, early chemistry of life happened when the sediment slowing and cooling coming out of the earth would settle into these little holes where the, where the um, environment was a bit quieter. And, and because they're in tiny holes and couldn't escape, they would cat be catalyzed together by the rocks and form chemicals and form the first life was basically scummy soap bubble membranes um, made of scum, made of soap bubbles. Uh, as soon as life has a membrane, it can start deciding which things it can have through the membranes and, and well, deciding is probably a strong word. As soon as you get a membrane, you can get separation between them. It's called phase separation. And, and, and then that, they were the first cells. Uh, and the most amazing thing about life, apart from its existence, is how quickly it happened. The first um, evidence for life that everyone can agree on is about 3.4 billion years old. Uh, but that life, everyone can agree on it because it's so obvious. They were whole reefs. There's a fossil reef that stretches across Western Australia. Um, and uh, it wasn't a reef, it wasn't made of coral because corals were still three billion years in the future. They were made of stacks of microbes and sand and microbes and sand. Uh, the microbes, which were like called cyanobacteria, which are basically the things that form the kind of oily pond scum, uh, uh, they would stretch as a kind of lawn of mucus on the ocean floor uh, and uh, they'd be covered with sand in, in a storm. And then the mucus would, and the slime would colonize the sand, uh, and then you get the mucus over the top. So it would go up to be a kind of layer cake of sand and slime. Um, and they'd form mounds called stromatolites, and the reefs were formed of those. <coughs> and these were the undisputed rulers of life for three billion years. And um, uh, I have some water. So, um, but there is evidence for stromatolites earlier than that at 3.7 billion, although not everyone can agree um, uh, 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 whether they are, but there is evidence, very tentative evidence, like a ghost of a whisper of a Cheshire cat smile, 4.1 billion years. And it's in a tiny crystal called a zircon. It's a very, very small microscopic. Now zircon is the mineral that makes these flashy rings that people have that look like diamonds, but bigger, these cubic zirconians, it's the same thing. In this tiny zircon is a little floor. And in this tiny floor is a smudge of graphite. But in other words, the same thing that makes pencil, pencil lead. Now graphite is pure carbon. And the chemistry of this pure carbon suggests that a living organism passed that way just by the, 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 the flavor of the carbon in it. And this zircon had once been in a rock that had formed all those billions of years ago that had been completely weathered away. Uh, and the zircon was deposited somewhere else, somewhere later. So in this, de what, this detrital speck of zircon is a smudge of what might be life as old as 4.1 billion years. So which is, 
just mind blowing. And uh, Claire has asked me, can you give us a sense of how to think about geological time? Three billion years seems crazy to think about. Uh, oh yes, I've been somewhat immersed in this for a while. I was trying to find a way in my book, uh, which I'll remind you is a very short history of life on earth available at aunties and other bookstores, there it is. Uh, very small it is. Uh, there are no illustrations in it because it's meant to be read as a story. It's like a bedtime story for grown-ups. It even starts once upon a time. But I do have some illustrations in it and they're time charts. Uh, they're six time charts and each time chart uh, is um, a tiny section of the time shot chart before. So I'm seeing if I can find time chart number six. I'll see if I can hold it up. Hold it up. There. What that does, that go, that's just hu human life. That goes from 125,000 years ago up to modern times. Uh, but that's just a tiny segment of another time chart, time chart five, that goes between 65 million years ago, the end of the dinosaurs, up to the present. And that time chart, that's charts time chart four, the age of mammals, and time chart four is a segment of time chart three, uh, which is, no time to find it. I should have prepared some slides here. Time chart three, which is complex life, and that goes from 700 million years up to the present. And that is just a, that one is a tiny segment of time chart two, which is life on earth, which goes from the earlier signs of life four billion years ago to the extinction of life on earth a billion years in the future. So I told you I'd give you a billion years for free. And that is just a tiny segment of time chart one, which goes from the birth of the universe till five billion years in the future. So one that's the only way I could think about it, is you telescope the time charts one into the other, into the other, into the other. And if you were going to put time chart six into time chart one, it would be microscopic. You'd have to use a microscope to see it. So the only way I could get a sense of that time is by uh, looking at it in at different scales. Uh, some people have asked me how I managed to get all that all that life into a into a book. Um, you know how why is it a not just a short history but a very short history? Well, I worked out that it's ruthless editing. That's the answer. Uh, if the Earth, I worked out that if the Earth. Um, kept a week per page diary, it would be 200 billion pages long. And uh, it would be as thick as the width of the Pacific Ocean. And most of it would be really boring because things happen so slowly. So what I did was I just took out the, ex to the exciting bits and you know, a bit two and a half billion years in the past that says small earthquake in Gondwana land went shopping. Uh, I um, I took that bit out uh, because, you know, it's rather dull. Um, so that's how I, I did that. Um, ah, in science, terms like plausible explanation suggest evidence and proof are used. How do scientists decide when they have proven something so they can speak with such confidence as if they have it correct? as though there are no chance, that is no chance that they are wrong. Ah, well, scientists shouldn't speak like that at all. Every scientific, uh, that's usually a, a kind of illusion. Uh, science should never prove anything. All science does is constrain um, the realm of ignorance. Uh, I, I, I have got quite a good way of, of, of saying this. Um, so, uh, science, does, science does not, science is not the accumulation of facts uh, with the concomitant dim, diminution of the puddle of ignorance. It's not a zero sum game. What people tend to find is the more things they discover, 
the more ignorance there is. The, the realm of the unknown gets larger. Uh, so, uh, in fact, it's a kind of cliche that when somebody talks about scientific research, they say, this research raises more questions than it answers. Uh, so the more scientists discover, the ignorance increases disproportionately because they actually realize how, how, lit more, how little they actually know. What science does is it establishes bounds on what we can know. Uh, now, um, I'm gonna write a philosophical tome about this one day, um, and I'm going to extol the brilliance of somebody who I think will be seen in by posterity as the greatest philosopher of the, of, the, of the 20th century, and that is Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of State for Defense, who in the course of doing something completely different, classified knowledge into three domains. There was the known knowns, the things that we know we know, and the known unknowns, the things that we know that we don't know, and the unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know. Now, science tends to take place in the second of these domains, the things that we know that we don't know. So we have some idea that there's something out there that we don't know, and we go and investigate it. Occasionally, something completely unexpected comes in from the unknown unknown, which like the little hominin from Flores, which nobody was expecting. But most things come from the known unknown. Uh, and um, so science, oh, this is what I was going to say. When I go and talk about my job, nature, excuse me, I, I stand up and I say something which my colleagues find absolutely shocking and wish I didn't say, and that is everything we publish in nature is wrong. And what's more, we're proud of it. Uh, of course, I don't mean that it's wrong in the sense of false or made up. I mean that it is provisional, it's approximate, and someone will come along and find a better approximation. For example, we know that Darwin's theory of evolution works because it's been shown time and time again by evidence that Darwin could not have known about. Now, it's been tweaked in all kinds of ways, but there's been no idea that has been supported by evidence that actually encompasses evolution within a bigger theory. In the same way that Einstein's general theory of relativity replaced Newton's mechanics. Um, uh, oh, there's lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to come in in a minute. Uh, Einstein's theory of ge general relativity encompasses Newton's mechanics because it explains things that Newton's mechanics have difficulty with, such as very, very, very massive things traveling at very, very fast speeds. But that doesn't mean that apples still don't fall out of trees as much as they did in Newton's day. But general relativity, it's, it's been shown to be true in many, many, many tests. However, it still doesn't explain everything about the universe that we can observe. Uh, if you want to have a quick uh, briefing about this, I recommend you look at the YouTube videos by a friend of mine, Sabina Hossenfelder, who's a, uh, a, a theoretical physicist, and she has a, um, a wonderful book out whose name I've forgotten, uh, which basically says that um, look, theoretical physicists have lost their way. They just think things are right because the equations look pretty rather than whether they actually tell us anything. Um, but uh, Sabina has uh, got a great sense of humour and she's, um, uh, but she does a lot of YouTube videos giving an explainers about, about that. So, and I looked at some yesterday, it's great. <clears throat> um, so that's, that's, uh, that's science. If, uh, so there's always more of an approximation and I could go on about this and I might come back to it. Uh, in fact, I will come back to it in a minute and then I'll look at Laura's question. Um, there is a wonderful spoof journal called the Journal of Irreproducible Results. Uh, and, and occasionally they have an Ig Nobel Prize, which awards prizes to completely ridiculous nonsense science, some of which is actually quite good, but, you know, uh, seems a bit strange. Uh, and they, they, they um, sometimes they put a book out uh, and they had a paper which was entitled, it was a spoof on theoretical physics. They, it was called, in which, no, it is called, oh, what's it called? Yes, it was called peanut butter has no effect on the Earth's rotation. 
Uh, and then it has a list of about a thousand authors because in these big theoretical physics or big actual experimental physics in you know CERN or the, you know the Large Hadron Collider there are thousands of people working on these experiments and if you look at the authors it's got Mickey Mouse and Marilyn Monroe and it's got everything and at the bottom is the actual paper itself and it says as far as we can tell peanut butter has no effect on the earth's rotation um so the, the the key to that is as far as we can tell you see it might be that in some regime in some experimental conditions that haven't been tried peanut butter does have uh, an effect on the earth's rotation but they haven't looked at that now laurie asks do i agree with yuval harari's idea of a cognitive revolution that is knowing we don't know happened at a certain phase of human evolution possibly i've not read that book uh, and i should that's sapiens isn't it uh, yes that's on my that's on my ever increasing list of books to read. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you might come across, habitués of bookstores may well know this Japanese phrase called tsundoku, tsundoku, I'll just type it. And it means the, the state of having piles of unread books everywhere by the bedside, you know, I, I, you know, on the kitchen table, on top of the fish tank, you know, um, underneath the dog, uh, whatever. So what happens, uh, I've got a, a different, I've, I've got a derivative of that, which I've just put here. When people suggest to me a book I really must read, I say I'll add it to my Sundo Q. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I was talking to Claire before we all joined the meeting about, you know, I've redecorated my office and I, I had to get rid of a whole load of books and I hate getting rid of books, but, you know, I'm going to be 60 soon and there's going to be books that I'm never going to read. So I had to weed some out, but of course that frees up more book space to fill with more lovely books. So, uh, so there we are. So Sapiens, that is definitely in my Tsundoku. Um, so, uh, <coughs> yes, Jennifer, don't we all? Um, with the writer that I've not read the book, I think there was some kind of cognitive revolution or probably a series of cognitive revolutions. And you can tell this by the fact that non-human hominins produce artifacts that we actually cannot understand. They're these wonderful artifacts, these teardrop chip rocks called hand axes. They could fit in the hand, although some of them are very big. Um, and they're beautifully made and they're always made in the same stereotype way uh, and they were on the earth for about an, all over the uh, old world for about a million years you can find hand axes and they're made out of all kinds of stone materials but they were all made in the same way now having something made in the same way for a million years is not something human beings do we're always adapting and changing so these tools which are associated with um an early hominin called Homo erectus, looked to me like they were made in a very stereotyped way, in the same way that ants make ant hills or bees make honeycombs or birds make nests. They, um, although they were beautiful artifacts, they tend to suggest a kind of stereotypical behavior, which is not what we associate with technology. Um, and this is shown by the, uh, by the fact that even now, we can appreciate these things are beautiful, but we've no idea what they were for. If you're just going to slice up a skin or a carcass, and I live near the sea coast where there's lots of flint, it's very easy to strike a flint and make a very, very sharp edge uh, that you could um, use to, to cut something. Uh, and you don't have to chip around and make it look beautiful. It'll dull soon, but then you just chip another one. So why would you go to all that effort to make that and also if you're going to have make it as a stone to throw at something why go all to that effort to go to have something you were just going to throw at something when you could just throw any old rock so it doesn't make sense in the term in we think of it as technology however it's not it doesn't uh, it, the people who were making it didn't have that spark that human cognition the first signs of it happened in South Africa about 125,000 years ago, where people started doing things like make jewellery and um, 
uh, uh, using ochre and soot, and also beads made out of perforated shells. So they were kind of decorating themselves. So that tends to suggest a, a kind of self-awareness uh, in the sense of the dawning of cognition. But then here is the one that Yuval Harari might have been meaning is that around 45, 46,000 years ago or so, cave art started to appear. Uh, now everyone knows about the cave art in France and Spain, all those beautiful, beautiful, wonderful pictures of animals and, um, uh, and, and uh, on the caves. And quite recently, similar cave art has been found on the other end of Eurasia in Borneo and Sulawesi. Uh, pictures of wild pigs and pictures of people hunting. Uh, so these seem to be reflect the kind of dawn of cognition. Um, and I think in the book, I kind of come to the end of it, really, when I say um, I'm going to read this bit because I think it's quite a good bit, even if I say so myself. Um, I should have put a marker in this even though it's a very short history of life on earth i still have trouble finding it here we are images of animals appeared on cave walls at arc oh, i'll read a bit a bit, uh, read a bit um, earlier from eastern europe modern humans followed the course of the danube where at its headwaters there is evidence of a flowering of cultural exuberance they made sculptures of animals, humans, humans with animal heads, and even bas-relief ducks that they could hang on suburban cave walls. They made again and again sculptures of obese, pregnant and huge-breasted women, poignant invocations of the importance of abundance and fertility in a society that was never far from starvation. They were appeals to a higher power. Images of animals appeared on cave walls at opposite ends of Eurasia, more or less simultaneously. The justly famous cave paintings of France and Spain have been joined by similar examples in Sulawesi and Borneo in Indonesia. These too had ritual content. Cave art tends to appear in spaces that are acoustically resonant. The pictures seem likely to have been just one component of rituals but also included music and dance. When human beings came of age, they were invited by a shaman into these ritual spaces for initiation into the tribe. As part of the ceremony, the inductee was painted with ochre or soot and told to make an impression of their hand on the cave wall, as if to make their mark in the book of life to say, I am here, I am here. After 4.5 billion years of mindless tumult, the earth had birthed a species that had become aware of itself and what it wondered would it do next. So there you are, that's the bit at the end. Um, what am I, um, thank you, what am I going to write about next? Well there's something that I gloss over in the book. I get to the bit that I've just read and then I talk, I, I, I jump over the whole of human existence to talk about what might happen after human beings are gone, talking about how the evolution of life might play out until it finally dies out around a billion years in the future. One thing that, um, because for all its comings and goings, life on earth is governed by just two things. Um, the slow decline of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Yes, decline. I mean, it has its ups and downs, and now it has some quite alarming ups, but over the scale of billions of years, it's down. And the other thing is the slow increase in brightness of the sun. In a billion years' time, uh, carbon dioxide will be too scarce to allow plants to, to photosynthesize, and the sun will be too hot to allow it to survive. Uh, and about that time, all the radioactive elements that create the heat in the earth that drives the plate tectonics will have expired and plate tectonics will stop and that will hot stop the entire earth system and basically choke life to death. Um, uh, so what am I writing my next? 
I think I've become quite interested in human extinction and extinction in general. Um, mammal species last about a million years in general, on average, some are longer, some shorter. And humans and mammals, although unusual in many ways, we're still mammals and we will become extinct sooner or later. Um, I, there, are also, uh, there are a lot of signs in the biosphere to suggest that it might be sooner. And one thing that worries me, and I don't think it's been genuinely appreciated, is a concept called extinction debt. And that's basically dead man walking. Uh, uh, it's been shown to be, um, it, it was first advanced as a, as, as a model in nature, and I steered that one to publication about 20 years ago or so, uh, by a theorist called Mike Hassel. And what it shows is that you can have creatures living quite happily in a habitat, even, and there may be lots of them, and they may be doing very well, but there comes a point where you can just chip away at the habitat, and even though they seem to be going on very well, that chipping away at that habitat, that patch of habitat, makes death inevitable. Now, the problem with human beings is we're the dominant species on one patch of habitat, the Earth, and um, we have been making it less habitable. Resources are hard to find. Climate change is one feature of that. So uh, I think the human humans will become extinct on Earth. Well, this is what I've got to think about. This is what I might write to find out about next. My my guess, which is really just a guess, is within the low ten thousands of years. But it might be sooner. It might be later. But that's what I'm thinking of writing about next. But I've got to do a lot of reading and research and writing and thinking and talking to people before that. Um, uh, Laurie says about Yuval Harari, storytelling and the unknown are part of cognition. Uh, that is, um, I, I agree with that. And that's something I alluded to in another book, which is available in all good bookstores, which is called The Accidental Species, Misunder Misunderstandings of Human Evolution. And that was published by University of Chicago in 2013. And in that book, I try to show that humans are nothing special. We, you know, we, the, the evolution of humans is not uh, um, some ordained manifest destiny. And I was trying to show that many of the things that we have, uh, we do, animals also do, like uh, making tools and thinking about things and so on. But the only thing that we seem to do that, as far as we know, other animals don't do is tell stories. Um, and uh, what I've done in my new book, A Very Short History of Life on Earth, just in case you've forgotten, um, is tell a story, is tell a story about uh, human beings. Another great uh, event in human evolution that led to humanity was the evolution of the menopause, which, um, as many people know, is a thoroughly uncomfortable and unpleasant situation. But what it did was provide the evolution of grandmothers. Uh, and um, this was a kind of consequence of a lot of other things that were happening. And I talk about them in my book, like human being, human babies have very big heads. And uh, if they waited any longer to be born, they wouldn't be born. But the mother wants the baby to be born quite soon because the more the baby waits to be born, the more difficult birth is. And as we know, childbirth is an extremely dangerous part of life for mother and baby. So there's a kind of conflict between mother and baby. I'm talking about in evolutionary terms. So human babies tend to be born in a rather undeveloped state and take a lot of caring for. Um, and uh, so that's at one end of the uh, one end of life. Uh, in the other end of life, is the menopause where uh, females become, females cease reproduction, but can still live for longer. Now, usually in, in animals and certainly in pre-humans and I'm like Homo erectus that made hand actors, animals are born, grow up quickly, have sex and die. Uh, and that's what happens. But humans have added 
two stages to that. Humans are born, they have a long childhood, they have sex, they have a long post-reproductive period, and then they die. Now the childhood and the post-reproductive period go together. Uh, in the calculus of evolutionary theory, it doesn't pay a woman to keep having babies once her daughter is old enough to have babies herself. Because in, until very recently, uh, when society was always on the verge of starvation and resources were limited, if a mother was having babies and her mother was having babies, they would be using the same genes and competing for the same resources. So it became much more sensible and much uh, more likely to raise offspring to reproductive age themselves is if a woman had a daughter of reproductive age, she would stop reproducing and help her daughter raise her grandchildren. And so what happens is, um, even though a woman stops reproducing, eventually she actually raises more descendants rather than keeping to reproduce herself. So uh, that is what drove the evolution of the menopause uh, and, and, uh, and the evolution of grandmothers and the elders of the village. And in pre-literate societies, some even today, I've heard stories of people going to remote uh, villages in Africa or New Guinea and um, wanting to know about the history of the tribe. And they'll be taken to a hut where they have some extremely decrepit old person who is kept um, alive just to be the repository of memory and story of the of the tribe um, so while all the younger women were having babies and while all the younger men were out hunting the older men and women would be teaching the younger the children and although many animals can learn not many animals actually teach uh, animals like birds learn their bird songs from other birds. Whales learn whale songs from other whales. Uh, chimpanzees know how to bash rocks from other chimpanzees. But basically, it's learning by imitation in the same way that human babies pick up language. There is no conscious teaching. Um, so I think that was part of the cognition. And now we've run out of questions, but we're almost coming up to time, I think. Oh, well, maybe we'll just leave it there for today. Thanks. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, Henry. That was that was great. And we really appreciate you. you zooming in from across the world. I yeah. uh, hope everybody has a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat>